But it is great to be here. Um, I would like to thank UE Systems uh, for the invitation and the opportunity to, to come up to the conference and to share with you guys some of the things that we're doing at Dakota Gasification Plant. Um, I fear my presentation is going to be pushing my 45 minute mark uh, right to the limit and so I would just ask that if you would just make a note of your questions and hopefully we'll have lots of opportunity to answer them at the end. Uh, my talk this morning is on developing an effective ultrasound program. Um, just a little bit about Dakota Gasification Plant to start with. Uh, we're located in west central North Dakota. This is an aerial view of the plant site. Uh, it's about a square mile in area and actually encompasses what you would uh, see as the tan buildings in this photograph. We're owned by Basin Electric Power Cooperative. The bluer buildings that you see in the background are also owned by Basin Electric Power Cooperative and it's part of their Antelope Valley power generation facility. We actually began commercial operation in 1984. Our construction cost at that time was about $2.1 billion. At this point, we're running an availability of just about 91% um, with our maintenance budget running uh, a little over $60 million. At this point, our staffing is about 700 people. As far as products, our main product, uh, we take lignite coal and we synthesize it. We convert it into synthetic natural gas. That's probably the main product coming out of the plant right now. Some other products um, that are more dominant in our market would be ammonium sulfate and hydrous ammonia that go toward the agricultural industry. Also carbon dioxide is a byproduct of what we do. And uh, we're actually the largest CO2 sequester in the world today. In the beginning, uh, for us, for plant reliability at Dakota Gas, was actually in the year 2000. Um, we actually did a, have a UE2000, and we actually had an infrared snapshot camera. If any of you remember the old snapshots, it was like a Polaroid. We had them, they were in a box in the back of the tool room collecting dust. Um, but that's where we started with our programs. Where we are now um, in regard to ultrasound, we do utility system leak detection primarily on our instrument air header. We recently launched a slow speed bearing monitoring program that's mainly focused in coal handling. We do electrical inspections on about 4,000 pieces of electrical equipment annually and we use a grease caddy for electric motor relubrication. We have about 1,800 NEMA frame, above NEMA frame motors on site. On the infrared side, we do um, routine uh, four to six week uh, infrared surveys on several pieces of process equipment. We do electrical inspections, of course. We actually took um, and trained our electrical staff up to what we would call like a level one equivalent in the infrared and ultrasound um, technologies. We actually turned the whole program over to them, which is kind of nice. You know, they're the experts in the, the electrical world. Um, they're able to analyze and diagnose problems better than me. And so we're really just acting as a support role in that program at this point. Uh, we're trying to get a thermal loss inspection program uh, on the ground right now. We actually have two gas infrared cameras, if you're familiar with that technology. We have a lot of ammonia on site. We have a lot of combustible gas. And we've been able to um, justify and purchase that technology as well. And we just started doing flare monitoring with the infrared too. So we're, we're pleased with all the programs that we have up and running. Um, at the same time, uh, there's a lot of opportunity. As far as program development, when I look at it, I really break it down um, into assessment, development, and implementation. There's also some subtasks out of there. For me, this just rep represents um, phases of program development, um, gives me some breakpoints 
so to speak. Because um, as you work through this whole program, at least for us, um, I mean, it may take a matter of days and weeks, um, but some of these program rollouts for us has taken years. And so it's good to have breakpoints. As far as the assessment, I really just start asking some questions, you know, do you need equipment? Do you need a program? And so I begin asking a series of questions. Do you have areas where you have known equipment maintenance deficiencies? Do you have undesirable equipment failures? Maybe you have compliance or insurance mandates, or maybe you're just having problems with personal safety. Uh, maybe there's just an opportunity for some increased energy savings. If you're answering yes to those types of questions, for me, the next thing is to, to find a technology that is going to meet that application and solve that problem. And the only thing I know how to do in that, to begin that process is really research, coming to conferences like this, surfing the internet, um, talking to industry um, specialists, um, reading trade magazines, going to trade shows, you name it, you know, somehow you need to look at the problems you're having, you need to look at the technology that's available out on the market today, and you need to, to begin to see that that technology will provide you a solution. Once I find some technologies that look like they're going to provide me that solution, I like to get them on site. I'll either rent it, um, I'll get a loaner from the manufacturer, I've even hired contractors to come on site. And the whole purpose of it is just to actually do an on-site survey. I want to see if that, tech, if that technology is actually going, going to work in my application. I want to evaluate its effectiveness. I want to see what the benefits might be. Um, and, I, and most importantly, I want to be able to see if I can begin to justify not only the equipment cost, but the program cost too. Just a few tips on doing a survey. Um, basically, it's just look for low-hanging fruit. Are there areas in your facility that you may have frequent equipment failures, undetected equipment failures? Um, our plant instrument air header is a good example of undetected equipment failures. When, in fact, we started out with the UE2000, started walking down our instrument air header, and we found air hoses that were blown out, valve diaphragms, regulators, seals, you name it, that are blown out all over the place. But because of the high ambient noises, um, maintenance operators, they walk by it every day, um, and you just can't hear it. And so tools like, like the ultrasound you know, probes are ideal for finding that kind of a failure. Failures that in the past are almost impossible to find. If you have areas where you have frequent production losses, maybe compliance issues or safety problems, um, is there a, an opportunity to free up manpower? Maybe you have no existing program um, in certain, area, certain areas of your plant or, or gaps in your, your programs. So those are all areas that when I demo equipment, when I bring it on site to see if it's going to work, um, for me, those are target areas for low-hanging fruit. Once I find a technology that looks like it's a good fit, um, now I sit down and I start to develop the concepts of the program, um, and what I mean by that is I'll actually write down what the goal of the program is, what the program is going to do, you know, are the, the benefits um, production related, safety related, compliance related, manpower related. I'll, I'll begin to develop some high level workflows on how this program is going to work. Um, within the environment of the plant. I'll also start to develop some manpower responsibilities um, as far as, and, and I try and lay those out in a spreadsheet and I've got an example here. 
This would be an example of a workflow chart. This one was actually for our electrical and maintenance program. Um, it was a little unique because we were using two technologies on the front end, um, those being infrared and ultrasound. And so there's a dual front end on this program, pushing it into a single back end. Um, interesting thing was when we got to our airborne leak detection program, it was basically a copy and a paste because we were using ultrasound and infrared for those programs as well. This is just an example of a responsibility chart laid out by task and, um, and position within the plant. Once I get a concept laid out, I move forward um, and begin out the justification and hopefully um, get approval for that program. As far as uh, the justification, I'll go ahead and I'll add to my concept a problem statement. I'll detail out what kinds of problems are being experienced, what effect is it having on the plant, plant production, plant safety, and I'll actually um, detail out a solution statement. How does this technology solve that problem? I also like to align it with the company goals. Um, it just seems to add a little bit more weight to your justification. And if I've, if I've seen some, some high level return on investments that I can use or some KPIs, I'll integrate those as well. Some references that you can use to add some weight and some strength to your justification. Um, your pilot survey, um, you, can, you can go out and you can get similar industry successes and you can pull those as are applicable. Also, use industry best practices. We brought on site a uh, $100,000 ammonia gas infrared camera and the day before we were supposed to ship it back, we got a call from our ammonia unit. They said, we've been looking for an ammonia leak all day. We can't find it. We're getting ready to shut the unit down. We can't operate um, under the current conditions. We took the camera, went out there. We found the leak and isolated it in 30 minutes. The next morning, my boss was told by plant management, buy that camera. Because we justified a hundred thousand dollar camera in one save. Um, so those things happen and it's nice when, when they do. I like to lay out a program overview and just to note I like to be conservative and I like to stick to the facts. When you go out for your justification you don't wanna you don't wanna cut yourself too thin, you don't wanna over inflate the facts because you don't wanna get um, down the road and the program doesn't turn out a good program, doesn't turn out the way, quite the way you expected, and you lose credibility or the program loses credibility. You know, what we found a lot of time is you're, if you're really standing on a good program, there's, uh, there's plenty of justification out there. You don't need to stretch and overinflate and, and all those types of things. The return on it's gonna be there. This is just an example of a program overview um, you can see I've just um, quickly stated, you know, some of the high-level concepts of the program and, and in a short paragraph or two, just detail out, you know, how that area of the program is going to work. At, at this point, when you're out seeking justification, most of the time you don't need a lot of detail. You just need, you need, you need to keep it high-level. Once I've gotten my justification to, to move forward with programs, um, now it's just, it's really a matter of taking all that concept information and detailing it out. Um, you need to detail them out, test all your workflows. Now is a good time to go ahead and develop your procedures, develop your training material, um, take a closer look at your KPIs, your re how you're going to document return on investment. Um, keep updating your doc or your concept information as you as you move along because sooner or later you're going to need that again. Um, this is also for me a good time to promote the technology. Um, I'm always on the lookout.
for that low-hanging fruit. I'm looking for advocates that are going to help promote the program. It's a lot easier to roll a program out um, with a team of people that, that want it and welcome it, you know, than to roll it out the door to a bunch of guys that are a bunch of people that, that really um, just think it's more work. Um, and, it, and a lot of times it is more work, but in the end, um, the return is better. Um, one example, um, when we were getting ready to roll out our slow speed bearing program, I started working with our um, operations superintendent of our coal handling area. Um, I laid out the details of the program, told him what we were trying to do. We actually went out into the field with the 10,000, let him use the equipment, and he was like a kid in a candy store. Once he saw this equipment worked, he was running down the galleyways, testing all these bearings, and he got to the end and he said, this program is great, I really like it. I want it in the field as soon as you can. So now, all of a sudden, I wasn't pushing the program. They were pushing me to get it out into the field. And, uh, and so it's good to be in that position. Uh, some workflow examples that you're going to have to take a look at. Um, you know, how's your CMMS system work? How are you going to schedule surveys? What frequency are you going to do them? What are the logistics of them? Who is going to do the analysis work? How are you going to report and document results? Um, you need to look at the life cycle of your work orders. How are they going to get generated? How are they going to get closed? Um, if, you, if you document failure coding, um, who's going to be doing that? Who's going to be doing the repair work? Do you need to do follow-up work? Um, there are programs that we don't do follow-up work. We don't have the manpower. Um, and so at this point, we've made a decision, a conscious decision, not to do follow-up work. There's other programs, um, like when we're out looking for ammonia leaks, combustible gas leaks, follow-up work is mandatory. We have to make sure that we close that loop. Um, how are you going to handle equipment history? And, um, and how are you going to manage performance reports? Um, if you have people involved in your programs outside of your group, performance re reports are a good way to stay in, in contact with those people, to, um, to let them know how the program is doing, to feed them information on how to improve it, um, it's a good way to keep in touch with management and maintain that, you know, their support and their buy-in of the program. So performance reports um, are important. At that point, you can take a look at how you're going to implement and actually roll out your program. Of course, by this time, all your program workflows need to be functioning well. You need to look at how you're going to handle your personnel training recognizing that, um, that different people within your organization uh, will need different levels of training. Um, and when I look at training, especially when it comes to infrared and ultrasound, I always like to include our safety and security groups because a, um, a lot of applications with infrared and ultrasound will roll over into safety and security. security. Security for us is, is also our firefighting group. And um, infrared is a great tool to use, you know, if you're trying to put out a, a coal fire inside a wall out in coal handling. And so um, I actually have some strong advocates of my programs in safety and security, even though they never pick up a camera or pick up an ultra probe. Um, you need to think about how you're going to communicate the results of your program. Again, it's a good way to, to maintain support for your program. Uh, as you roll out uh, the program, there's always adjustments. 
and there's, there's always unforeseen things that come up, fine tuning that needs to happen. And so, you know, you need to be alert for it. Um, a lot of it is good constructive um, comments. And so you need to look at your program and adjust accordingly. Um, the programs, I mean, they're good programs. And so you don't want them to fail. Sometimes you have to compromise a little bit. Um, but you want to make it as easy for people in the field to accept it as well. Obviously, the, the whole focus of the program is to add money to the bottom line of the company, to find some good finds, to find the golden eggs, so to speak. And so I'd just like to share with you, you know, as we begin to wrap this up, some of the successes that we've had at the plant. This first one is, um, comes out of the electrical application. It actually um, goes back about eight years ago when we had our UE2000. We had just brought our, our CO2 compression unit up online about three months before this. And we took our UE2000 and we were doing an MCC survey and we got to the back of this starter for this 20,000 horsepower motor and we picked up Corona. And so we powered it down, opened up the cabinet, and we found this incorrectly landed uh, ground braid. If this had gone to, to failure, it would have easily been a multi-million dollar loss. Again, on the electrical side, about a year ago, we started baselining all our uh, oil-filled transformers, and we found some interesting results. And I'll play, I'll play these um, sound files in Spectralizer um, in just a minute to let you see and hear what those sounds look like. I, I mentioned we just rolled out a slow speed bearing program a short time ago and we're, we're just at the point now where we're starting to be able to correlate sound signatures with, with bearing failure mechanisms. And so that's exciting for us to be at that point. Um, we're not 100% sure, you know, on our calls yet, but, um, you know, as you probably heard in some of the, the sound files you, that you heard yesterday, that when, when there's a fault, um, it becomes pretty clear. So, Dave, if you want to bring us into Spectralizer and then go to Dual, go out and get that first file. And we're going to start with, this is the, um, the good oil-filled transformer. Now, this transformer is 30 years old. And this is a typical sound um, signature from our 30-year-old transformers that are on site. So if you want to run that one, Dave. As you can see, there's a lot of harmonics in there, um, 60 hertz harmonics. You know, but the, uh, the time series actually looks pretty clean. Um, and my impression is that the 60 hertz harmonics are probably me mechanical in nature. When you look at it, you can see, you know, that, that really the, the baseline is nice, consistent. Um, there's not a lot of excess energy spikes or anything in there. And so, again, um, you know, although there's a lot of harmonics, um, we have no other indicators that say there's a problem with this transformer, so we're saying this transformer is good. This transformer that Dave is going to play next is, has been online two years and is, is technically, as far as life cycle of a transformer, this is a brand new transformer. And go ahead and play that one. Did you go to dual? Yeah. Okay. Did you notice a difference? <laughs> you can really see a lot of uh, resonance um, up on the FFT. There's certain areas where there's just an enormous amount of energy, um, a lot of harmonics, a lot of resonance, and we're actually having failures on these transformers already. There's actually two of these transformers on site. 
They both sound the same. Um, and if you wonder why you're having problems, I mean, it's pretty clear to see, you know, what, I mean, why we're having problems with brand new transformers. Um, in my understanding, one of, the, one of the things that lead to this is, you know, our old 30-year-old transformers are built like a Sherman truck, and they're tough, and they're durable. There's a lot of iron in them, so they don't resonate. Um, all the, a lot of the new transformers, um, you know, they marginalize the iron inside it um, to make them less expensive. And um, in this case, it looks like we just, we, um, we didn't buy a good product, and it's, it's just resonating. And um, it's actually just um, resonating to the point where it's, it's self-destructive. Um, moving on to the next one. This is a, um, a good slow speed bearing. These bearings are, uh, they've got about a three and a half, four inch um, inside diameter. They're about 80 RPM. They're out in coal handling on the, the, our big conveyor belts out there. This is a good one. So you can hear a little bit of background. Uh, but overall, when you look at the energy that's there, it's, it's actually pretty minimal. There is some, um, but not too bad. This next one that Dave is going to play for us um, would be a cracked race. And now if you do a time series stop stop. You can see how, how, cycl how cyclical it is. And um, you know what we're finding in, on slow speed is that um, bearings can survive in slow speed under the right conditions with failures that would take out a bearing probably in hours or days in high speed. We've actually had uh, bearings that we've pulled out that had cracked outer races. And when we went back into the audio files, that cracked race was there for a year. And, uh, and so slow speed is, is an interesting um, application if you have the opportunity to get into it. Now if we want to play the last one, this would be an example of spalling. And you will hear that there is a cyclical nature to it, but um, it's a lot more gravelly, a lot rougher sounding. You can see a, there's a lot more energy in the baseline, you know, on a spalling. So, if we go back to the PowerPoint, Dave, thanks. Those are just some examples of, of um, some of the applications that we're doing at the plant. Um, on the energy saving side, um, this also goes back probably about five years. We still had our UE2000 at the time. Um, we went into our boiler house and started walking down the instrument air header. And we had air hoses that were completely blown out. We had valve diaphragms, seals, radiators, um, you name it. We had leaks all over the boiler house. And um, when UE came out with their um, with some of their air loss tools, we actually went back and we kind of did a back of the envelope calculation just to see what kind of results we had in the boiler house. And we estimated that we were losing about $300,000 per year per boiler on instrument air alone. And our boiler house has three boilers. So you can see how the money can add up just a note on the instrument air header too, one of the more soft savings is, you know, if you improve the performance of your instruments, you should see an improvement on your output product. I mean, and when you think about it, it really makes sense, right? 
The other thing is that your operators are going to be happy because they don't have to work so hard. Because when your instruments aren't working, you know, who are the ones that have to overcome that difficulty, right? When the valves aren't working, when you're, like we have guns that drive into the boiler um, for liquid fuels. And I remember the operators used to go up there and they used to have to kick them in <clears throat> because, um, you know, when they, when they actuated that gun to go into the boiler, there wasn't enough pneumatic energy to drive it into the boiler. So, I mean, obviously they weren't happy about it. And when we got up there and really started looking at what was going on, there were air leaks all over the place. So, um, just a note there on that. We took a look at the grease caddy and we, we took a look at our motor re to take our relubrication program from a PM based program to a condition based program it in the trash and we started from scratch. Um, so we built our whole relube program up from scratch um, within about six months after we rolled it out we were fortunate enough we had two industry specialists on site one was a liability manager from Royal Purple um, another gentleman um, Ray has his own uh, lubrication consulting company they were on site they looked at our program and uh, and we were pleased you always hope that when you roll a program out that you're you're moving forward they actually gave us a, a best-in-class a world-class rating on our lube program so we were um, we were thrilled about that as we start to close out here um, just thought I'd show you this um, this is what programs are supposed to avoid. Um, this is actually a catastrophic failure of one of our slow speed bearings out in coal handling. Again, the, the um, inside diameter is about three and a half to four inches. And uh, this bearing actually failed, wore all the way through the pillow block, rubbed on the I-beam frame. <laughs> and uh, this is as we were rolling out our slow speed bearing monitoring program and we don't have one infrared image, we don't have one ultrasound reading on this bearing, and today I, I still don't have a, a clue how, um, how that happened. But um, just an interesting observation, interesting failure. Um, some lessons learned for us, management support is critical. Um, we've been fortunate, we haven't always had a high level of support from management, um, and you can still do a lot of work. You can buy a lot of equipment. You can move forward with programs um, without a lot of management support. But obviously, if you do have management support, you're going to go twice as far, twice as fast. Also, it's, you can still, uh, equipment without a program is still a plus. Um, a lot of times, it's easier to, to, to justify the equipment and having it on site is good and, uh, because going to the program level sometimes takes a lot more resources and it's, it's a lot harder to convince management that you need to go there. So if you can justify the equipment, my recommendation would be to go ahead and justify it, buy it, get it on site, and sometimes over the next few years, you know, you'll have the opportunity to save the day, make some good finds, and, and just um, by virtue of having the equipment on site, you'll be able to build support for a program. And because of that, you know, look at developing programs to the greatest extent possible. Like I said, some of our programs, you know, we've been working on them for six, seven, eight years. Um, and so that's why we kind of take it in steps, we take it in phases. Oh, but we always look at developing a program to the greatest extent we can. So when the opportunity arises, um, we can take it to the next level and we're ready to go with it. Uh, patience and persistence in the end will provide a payback. Proficiency takes time, um, especially if you're working with operators, with outside maintenance people. If you're, if you're not doing all the work within your own group, <clears throat> you know, you just have to be, you have to understand that 
Um, a lot of these other people, they, they don't understand the technology and the, <clears throat> excuse me, the logic and the reason behind things like we do, so um, it takes a while um, for them to come up to speed. Promote the program whenever you're able. Expect to be baffled and, and frustrated on occasion, <laughs> if not frequently. Um, solicit feedback and share your findings to gain and maintain support. It, that's critical, it really is. Because um, a lot of the industry out there just doesn't understand reliability the way we do, and so we have to educate them. For us, looking forward um, is really just an, for us it's an issue of trying to get our hands around our world a little better. Um, we're actually in a situation where we have more programs on the table than we can staff. And so, so our hope is that over the next year or two that we'll be able to staff up to uh, support those programs a little better. As a result of that, we hope for better follow-up, better documentation. Um, we'd like to expand our slow speed bearing monitoring program this summer. We're actually hiring engineering co-op students out of, um, out of the colleges up in North Dakota to help support that. And uh, you know, as, he, as we get better with these programs, um, our goal is to develop an analysis guidelines so when new people come into the group, you can sit down and you can give them a book and you can say, this is a tool, these are the results. You know, when you get results, this is how you analyze them and what they mean. So we want to spend more time um, developing our analysis guidelines. Questions, comments? When implementing a new program and training operators and other maintenance personnel, yep. how do you overcome their resistance? It's, it's tough. Um, but one of the things that I try to um, bring to the awareness of operators is, is just like I said, you know, if you're going out there and you're finding failures proactively, that's less work that the operator in the long run has to do. If we're out there um, finding gas leaks, you know, that makes it safer for the operator. If we're out there finding all these problems on the instrument air system, um, you know, and their instruments are working better, and the plant is running better, in the long run, um, you know, there's a benefit to the operator. They don't see it up front, though. In fact, when, when Drew was up and did training for us, um, because we don't have, our culture right now is, is really fix on failure. You know, we're in a firefighting mode, um, <laughs> and Drew's chuckling back there. And we ran into that every day, believe me. Um, but the shining star for us was there was a guy that came in, sat down. He was an older tech. He sat right up front, which was unusual. And I think he came from, like, Dow Chemical or something. And after, with, after the training, um, we started talking with him. And he said, um, at their company, you know, they do this um, reliability-centered maintenance program. And he said, when, when they first presented it to us as operators, he said, we hated it. And we fought it tooth and nail. Um, however, he said, after we started to see the results and we realized that our units were operating better, he said, we finally came to the realization that it was a lot easier to walk around taking readings, right? Even if it was vibration or ultrasound readings, it was a lot easier to walk around the plant and take readings than, op than walk around the plant taking equipment in and out of service. My next question, sir, is are your operators in the maintenance department as well? Do they do operating maintenance repairs? Or are they separated? You have a separate maintenance department and an operating department. They're separate. So how do you bridge operators doing maintenance work? Um, generally, our operators don't do maintenance work. Um, they will do um, simple task PM work, you know, like add oil to a gearbox or something like that. 
um, but they don't do the, the heavier maintenance work. I'm, does that answer your question? Where are you going with it? Well, our operators are strictly operators, and now we're into yep. a program where we're trying to get them to do light maintenance, you know, uh, fasteners, maybe adding oil, uh, lots of resistance, you know. And sure. We keep trying to tell them what got your job before is not going to keep it. You have to progress and learn more things. And then they think right away, well, now that we're doing mechanical stuff on maintenance work, we need more, more money. And I, <laughs> yeah. it's a diabolical uh, <clears throat> argument. Uh, I can see where they're coming from, but I have to tell them that it will happen in time. You know, sure. yeah. you know thinking of self-reward first, and then, then monies will happen eventually, I'm sure. But it's a hard, it's a hard pitch. Yep. Yeah. In, in the end, you have to convince them that it's in their benefit. Yeah. And there's some guys that just won't come along. I mean, sorry. I mean, sometimes you just have to get out the big stick. Say, hey, I'm sorry. It's just your job. Sorry. Uh, can I just bring you back to the uh, oil fuel transformer that you mentioned? The one okay. with the harmonics and the resonance. Um, my first question is, um, has anyone, you said, has anyone failed already so far? You know, you said it's two years old, right? How many do you have and uh, has one physically failed? Yes, yes, we've actually had physical failures with, with this one. Okay. And um, so they've had to take it out of service, go in and fix it. And the, the plan is now to re-engineer that application. I mean, obviously that transformer is not going to work where it is. Uh, but then has the uh, supplier acknowledged that um, you know, and they're going to replace your other transformers of the same, you know, I presume you have, you have heard it from Yeah, the, we have two of them on site. And they're going to replace the other one too? Yep. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you guys.